Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. All right, so today's video is a little bit different, but we're gonna be making a peptide tier list. You may have seen these sorts of videos on channels where people are talking about athletes, workouts, even recreational drugs of all things. This is my attempt at being a bit humorous and of course not the end all be all, but we'll rank peptides based on a three pronged metric where we consider clinical research, efficacy, and purported risks. This is by no means the end all be all. As I said, if you want all the intricate details about these peptides, Check out my channel and you can search through individual playlists to truly dissect what we know and what we don't. And because all of my returning viewers and subscribers already know this isn't my regular type of content, for all you new ones out there, give my other vids a view if you like it, hit that like and subscribe button if you want to keep seeing peptide evidence-based content. It's the best way to help a small peptide YouTuber like me. So let's first discuss the tiers and then the contenders. Like I mentioned before, our discussion about each of these will be more brief, which is the hard part for me, but I think this is going to be fun maybe. So obviously we've got an S tier, the supreme super tier, followed by A through D, A we can call acceptable, and D is stay the heck away from that one. B through C are clearly somewhere in the middle, of which I'll have to somehow make some likely ambiguous cursory arrangements. Our contenders, drum roll please. We've got the GLP-1 agonists, MK677, which is technically a non-peptide agonist of the ghrelin growth hormone secretagogue receptor, BPC-157, its popular weird friend, TB-500, our recently discussed SS31, Ipamoralin, Tessamoralin, Sermoralin, CJC1295, IGF1, LR3, Frag, Epitalon, Melanotan2, and DSIP, Delta Sleep Inducing Peptide for Good Measure. Let's start with DSIP, the peptide theorized to augment delta wave sleep, which would enhance the deepest of our slumbers. However, generally hasn't been proven to do so. Even the research indicating if it's indeed endogenous is controversial and the peptide is, in a way, the skeptic's dream. But since it's not completely without research and appears to be generally well tolerated, despite the lack of data indicating whether it helps people, let's just throw it in the C-class. Okay, so what's next? How about we go into the GLP-1s? Instead of doing semaglutide versus terzepatide versus ritatrotide, which we've done a video essentially on previously. Heck, I'll link it in the description below. We're going to do the GLP ones alone. And although a significant amount of users experience side effects, typically in GI upset, like nausea, vomiting, their clinical utility has been profound and has drawn many people to peptides and, as we know, is probably the hottest new pharmacologic recently in years. And even though people will say you should be able to lose weight without pharmacologic assistance, my argument to that is time, and just utility as well. Yes, calories in, calories out is the basis of weight regulation. However, we are humans, I think, for the most part. And this compounds ability to regulate not only weight, but metabolic health in general through management of fasting blood glucose, HbA1c, lipid profile, has been significant and life-changing to many. I will place this S tier due most predominantly to its clinical use and benefits that many people in a healthcare setting have found. Now to SS31, a peptide we recently discussed, and to be honest, this is one of the most intriguing ones to me. It's not only participated in an impressive number of clinical trials, but it seems to legitimately find its way into mitochondria to help maintain their structure and function and will certainly be a hot topic of further peptide research, in my estimation likely one of the hottest. And although it seems reasonable that someone may get a headache or be transiently dizzy, it has been pretty well tolerated without serious side effects. And for that, given the amount and strength of the data at this point, pending further clinical research, I'm going to put SS31 in the A tier. Now the favorite of many, BPC-157, Brody Protection Compound, a pentadecapeptide derived from human gastric acid. And although I think many want to see this in the S tier, due to the paucity of clinical data, remember the BPC-157 conspiracy, and research or lack thereof involving humans and long-term assessments of its risk, especially given the interaction with VEGF and my fear of augmenting cancer risk, despite the fact that anecdote proves it has benefited many, and hey, I agree, it probably has, I've got to base my decision off what we actually know, and if there was a range 
range between B and C, I would do that, but I'll be generous, and since it's a body protection compound, B, P, C, I'll throw it in the B class. Time for tessamorelin, a growth hormone releasing hormone analog that has gained FDA approval for management of HIV associated lipodystrophy. And although we've talked countless times about the risks with augmentation of growth hormone, I've got to think about the population it's targeted to help, and that is those with chronic illness and associated muscle wasting with dysregulation of adipose tissue. That said, as a newer brand, Egrifta is prohibitively expensive, and considering these factors altogether, it's going to be in the B tier for me. Next, let's do CJC1295 and Sermorolin together, both of them growth hormone releasing hormone analogs like Tessamorolin. However, both of them currently unregulated by the FDA. Sermorolin was at some point, most recently about 20 years ago, CJC1295 tried to make its way through clinical trials, but a participant lost its life along the way. However, it appears that lead researchers didn't attribute the patient's death to the peptide itself. However, finding the actual data surrounding the person's death, which is understandable, is it's unavailable. So Sermorolin's positive is the fact that it was used in clinical practice previously for some time and was not discontinued due to reasons of safety and efficacy, hinting that it was well tolerated and didn't lead to serious adverse effects. CJC's feature is the addition of the drug affinity complex, or DAC, that we've discussed at length and will be in the description below, but it significantly prolongs its half-life to six to eight days while your typical growth hormone augmenter is under 30 minutes with regards to half-life. That said, as we've talked about before as well, prolonging half-life means prolonging presence of possible adverse effects if they exist. And when we're talking about unregulated use of these experimental peptides, you know, let's be clear here, my fear is not only the presence of unwanted ingredients, but with increasing growth hormone in particular, long-term concern for cancer and development of insulin resistance, I also feel that unless somebody is with muscle wasting due to age or deconditioned, in other words, growth hormone's natural decreases as we age may even be protective predominantly due to my concerns listed before. And for that reason, I'll play CJC1295, Sermorolin, and for the sake of similarity, Ipamorolin, although it's a ghrelin growth hormone secretagogue receptor agonist, who was in a clinical trial in patients for management of post-operative ileus in these people recovering from bowel resection, which showed insignificant findings, I'll place them all in the same category. And although they are generally tolerable, these peptides have not been recently investigated enough for me to change my mind about these aforementioned risks and clinical utility. And for that, they all go C tier. And since IGF-1 LR3 is a peptide that mimics the end product of this growth hormone releasing hormone pathway, IGF-1, the product essentially responsible for my risks of concern and has a long half-life itself, I'd be darned if I didn't at least rank it as a C. But because this is one I wouldn't consider touching, and this is my darn tier list, I'm going to put it in the D tier. Next, let's do Ibutamarin, or MK677. Since since it's similar, however technically a non-peptide, uniquely with strong oral absorption, and it's making its way through clinical trials. And if you look up LUM201, you will see that LUMOS Pharma developed a single oral dosing regimen that recently completed phase 2 trials for management of pediatric growth hormone deficiency. It's been generally found safe with the most prominent adverse effects as increased hunger, understandably. At times, it seems people have dealt with liver enzyme elevation, joint pain, and gastrointestinal upset. However, it is making its way through these trials well, will be with continued research, and since I'm a proponent of alleviating chronic illness, especially in the youth, this will be B tier. Now AOD 9604, the proposed lipolytic fragment of growth hormone intended to help people shred away cellulite. Big Pharma tried to grapple with this one after some positive rodent data, and the results showed pretty much nil. The data and trials have been a bunch of insignificant nada. This one's going at the bottom of my list, class D. Next. Similarly, fragment 176 to 191 is pretty much AOD 9604 with a single amino acid substitution, and there is even less data on this peptide than with AOD, and for that reason, you'll find it in precisely the same tier. Now, TB500. So I'm more bullish on TB4, of which TB500 is a 7 amino acid fragment that comes from it, than I am with TB500 itself. If you want more on these differences, see my recent video 
video on the Wolverine stack where I kind of go into the intricate details that discern between the two compounds. Heck, I'll link it in the description below as well. But the idea is that just like AOD and FRAG are fragments of growth hormone, TB500 is a fragment of TB4, which does have more research surrounding its use, similar to how growth hormone has much more data surrounding its administration than does AOD itself. And like PPC157, TB500 is pro-angiogenic and TB4, although has been seen to show benefit in different clinical contexts, as does some of its fragments, TB4 in particular seems to be anti-apoptotic, and in one study actually showed to inhibit efficacy of a certain chemotherapeutic drug. Now, I do think that its pro-angiogenic nature could acutely influence some processes of healing, but due to too many unknowns about this one, coupled by my concerns with increasing risk of development of cancer, compounded by the fact that this is my personal ranking list, gosh dang it, it's going category C for me. Now, epitalon, the peptide derived from a protein called epithalamin that in turn came from the bovine pineal gland, a Cavinson peptide theorized to increase telomere length and serve as an anti-aging tool and gyro protector. And like TB500, much of the data comes from epithalamin itself, not really epitalon. On top of that, the longer-term risks have not been assessed, and that which purportedly did is unavailable to the human eye, as in it's covered up somewhere, probably in a vault. Moreover, effective concentration of epitalon is a thousand times less than epithalamin, and 16,000 to 80 million times less than melatonin, which in my opinion, if anything, hints that the research is likely minimally translational when we're talking about drawing conclusions about epitalon from the epithalamin data. Because of the vagueness, you'll find it in my D tier. Let's finish this conversation up with Melanotan 2. As we approach summer, no better way to end this video than to discuss that which is considered the Barbie peptide, used to help people literally change the color of their skin and increase sexual drive. A case report indicated someone who used it and also used tanning beds developed melanoma. Another developed rhabdomyolysis or kidney injury due to the products of muscle breakdown. Another developed priapism or an erection that lasts so long penile tissue can become ischemic and require immediate surgical intervention. And somebody who developed this was actually one of the key researchers in understanding the peptide itself. And compounded by the risks, because I neither need to significantly tan or increase my libido, well, let's not go that far, this isn't one I would consider touching. I'll be frank with you, and for that, you'll find it in the lowest tier here. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this one. It was fun for me to make. Hopefully, it was a bit enjoyable for you to watch. Of course, for further details on these peptides, just go through the channel, type in your peptide of interest, or search through the playlists. If you haven't already, hit that like and subscribe button. You'll find the details to the Patreon in the description below. And most importantly, as always, have a wonderful day. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy.